Okay, it's um, a pleasure for me to, to tell you that we have three fantastic speakers today. We'll start with Adrian Chapman, then Laura Manchinska, both online, and then Ion Nikita on site. Um, uh, let me remind the speakers that they have 25 minutes for the presentation. I ask them to I mean, stick on time and then to have a, a bit of five minutes extra for questions and answers. Uh, and okay, without further delay, let's start with our first speaker, which is Adrian Chapman. And the title is Characterization of Free Fermion Solvable Spin Models via Graph Invariants. So please. All right, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak today. Um, so I'll be talking about some characterization work that I did with Stephen Famia when both of us were at the University of Sydney. Um, so it's published in Quantum uh, last year and it's currently on the archive. Uh, since then, Stephen has moved to the Center for Quantum Computing at uh, Amazon and I've moved to uh, the Department of Materials at Oxford. Um, okay, so the motivation for this project is finding exact solutions for uh, quantum spin models. And as a starting point, uh, we consider mapping to free fermion solutions, which is a sort of workhorse method uh, for finding uh, these solutions. So this is an elegant family of solutions and is also a useful starting point to attack problems which are uh, not necessarily free fermion, but rather are interacting or non-integral uh, problems using perturbation theory. And additionally, uh, free fermion solutions have a rich connection to complexity through what are called match gate circuits. Um, this was originally discovered in the context of the, the what's called the FKT algorithm for counting the number of weighted perfect matchings in a graph. Um, and uh, recently, a, a surprising connection has been shown between uh, free fermions and what's called the sensitivity conjecture uh, in just the last uh, couple of years. And in all of these applications, uh, graph theory plays a central role in, in the connection between free fermions complexity and uh, the solutions of spin models. So, okay, so I'll start by talking about what is a free fermion solution. Uh, so this is a Hamiltonian. It's a one-dimensional nearest neighbor Hamiltonian, which is sort of given as the conventional example for a free fermion solution. And I'm gonna say that this model is exactly solvable by what's, what we normally do is the Jordan-Wigner transformation. Um, so the Jordan-Wigner transformation consists of defining uh, Majorana operators or Majorana modes, which are Pauli operators in one-to-one -one association, sorry, in one-to-one -one association with Pauli operators um, given by Z operators on uh, a trailing end um, from a particular qubit, either to the left or the right, and this conventional will be to the left, and a, either an X or a Y on the qubit of interest. And so this maps uh, a set of two n Pauli operators on n qubits to a set of two n mutually anti-commuting fermion operators. And so they, these operators are Hermitian and they satisfy the canonical anti-commutation relations shown here. And because they are associated Pauli operators, they also square to the identity. So under the Jordan-Wigner transformation, uh, this one dimensional solvable Hamiltonian is mapped to a quadratic in the Majorana operators. Um, so gamma is now a vector of these operators and H is a coefficient matrix, which without loss of generality is real and anti-symmetric. Um, and what's important about this description is that uh, this allows us to see that the Majorana operators themselves transform covariantly under the evolution by the Hamiltonian. So this Hamiltonian is quadratic um, and uh, under, under this evolution, the Majorana operators themselves evolve according to the exponential of this coefficient matrix itself. So the coefficient matrix keeps track of sort of the single particle dynamics of the Hamiltonian. And because this is a two n by two n matrix, the effective description of the model is compressed down from a two to the n dimensional Hilbert space to an effective two n uh, dimensional space. And all of the relevant um, correlations, eigenstates and eigenvalues can be extracted from this description H. And, and because H is also an anti-symmetric real matrix, uh, the exponential is an orthogonal, a special orthogonal matrix of dimension 2n. So just to be a little bit more explicit, um, I can diagonalize the single particle Hamiltonian via a orthogonal matrix, or more appropriately, I can block diagonalize it uh, into blocks whose, which look like this, which are given by its Williamson eigenvalues uh, on the off diagonal. And then using this exact solution for the single particle transition matrix, I can find a unitary which uh, diagonalizes the, the full Hamiltonian um, and therefore allows me to write it as a sum of single Z Pauli operators with weights given by the 
even by the Williamson eigenvalues. And so this tells me that I can express the energies of this model as sums and differences of the single particle energies or the Williamson eigenvalues. And, oops, sorry, and this constitutes an exact solution of the model. So another seemingly different uh, exactly solvable model is what's called the Kataev Honeycomb model. So this is a two dimensional model and it consists of uh, interaction terms which are uh, links on a honeycomb lattice and the interaction type is dependent on the, on the uh, direction in which the link uh, is, is laid down. So, um, right, so in this uh, picture, the vertical links are ZZ, the blue links are XX and the red links are YY. And uh, this model has the property that uh, bonds on the cycles and on, if it's on a torus, uh, on the non-trivial, homotopically non-trivial cycles around the handle of the torus, multiply to constants of the motion. So products around cycles on this model uh, of the Hamiltonian terms commute with every term in the Hamiltonian. However, uh, for, the Honeycomb, uh, for the Honeycomb model, this is not actually enough to completely solve the model. Uh, so for an LX by LY lattice, the effective Hilbert space um, still contains of order LX by LY qubits, even when I restrict down to a mutual eigenspace of the cycles. And so what's needed to complete the solution is a free fermion mapping. And so uh, to just quickly explain this, um, the original solution by Kataev maps each qubit in the model to four fermions. Uh, so each Pauli type is mapped to a dedicated fermion together with a sort of shared fermion. So uh, these, this, the single qubit is mapped to four fermions and um, each uh, pair of qubits has a sort of dedicated pair of fermions that they share between them. And uh, this introduces a set of new symmetries present at every vertex given by the products of all four fermions at a qubit. And so fermions that are uh, shared between the qubits sort of pair up into what are called these bond constants of motion. And uh, these, these are also commuting terms with the entire Hamiltonian. Um, and so once I uh, fix these bond constant of motion degrees of freedom, their eigenspaces, uh, then what's left over is a set of matter uh, fermions, matter degrees of freedom, which gives me a free fermion model now on the honeycomb lattice, which I can solve once I fixed the eigenspaces of the, of the bond. Our question was, how do we unify these two uh, seemingly very disparate approaches? And uh, our answer uh, ended up being was related to what's called, uh, related to graph theory. So um, I'm going to define what we call a frustration graph. So a frustration graph is a graph defined from the Hamiltonian written in a specified Pauli basis. So this is a basis dependent description of the Hamiltonian. The frustration graph um, has vertices Whose, uh, which correspond to the terms in the Pauli Hamiltonian. And the vertices are going to be neighboring in the graph uh, if and only if the corresponding Pauli operators anti-commute. So here is the solvable model, the one dimensional solvable model that I uh, explained before. And on, um, on four qubits, the model has an interaction graph, which looks like this, has bond operators and single qubit on site Z terms. Um, but once I expand the description of this model into its frustration graph, um, I see that the frustration graph has sort of the same structure as the original one dimensional model, but with some uh, slight differences. And it's going to be this sort of microscopic or this, uh, this fine grained structure of this graph is going to be important in describing its free fermion solvability. Uh, so our question is when can we uh, map a given model to free fermions? So given a general Hamiltonian in the Pauli basis, as I said before, uh, we can define, the question is, when can we define distinct quadratic fermion operators such that the commutation relations are respected? So I'm going to uh, attempt to associate each Pauli to I times some quadratic in the Majorana operators. And uh, I want to do this in such a way that the Pauli's anti-commute, if and only if the pairs that I associate to each Pauli uh, overlap at one Majorana mode. And uh, this is a question that we can state purely in terms of graph theory. And that is to say, when can we label the vertices of the frustration graph by subsets of size at most two, the, the subset of Majorana modes, such that neighboring vertices intersect at exactly one element? And so this is a question that doesn't actually know anything about the Hamiltonian, but is stated purely in terms of the graph. And its answer turns out to be what are called line graphs. Um, so a line graph is a graph that I associate to another graph called the root. Um, so this is the root graph R. The line graph of the root graph R 
is another graph whose vertices correspond to the edges of the root and such that two vertices in the line graph are neighboring if the corresponding edges of the root share a vertex. So here's an example of a root graph, um, just this cycle with sort of dangling edges. And uh, to generate its line graph, I associate a new vertex to each edge in the root and the vertices themselves are neighboring, uh, the new vertices are neighboring if the edges in the root share a vertex. So we see that um, the vertices in the root graph which are, have degree greater than one are sort of uh, blown up to these clicks. Um, each vertex of degree three has a triangle surrounding it because all three edges uh, at that vertex are incident to each other. And so this gives the line graph uh, of this form. And you may remember from my previous slides that this, uh, this line graph is actually the graph, the frustration graph of the integrable model on four qubits that I had just shown. Um, so uh, before I continue, I'll just say that um, one characterization of line graphs, which is important for us, is what we call a cross decomposition. So a graph is a line graph if and only if there is, an, there is a partition of its edges, of the line graph's edges, into clicks such that every vertex in the line graph belongs to at most two clicks. So as I said before, a vertex in the root graph um, is a sort of shared incidence between all of the edges incident to that vertex. And so that vertex is expanded into a click. And so because an edge contains only two vertices, each vertex in the line graph now is incident to two clicks. So if this partitioning into clicks exists, uh, then the graph is a line graph. And we can see that for this graph, the uh, partitioning is just into these four triangles. And also these dangling vertices here uh, share a click, share, are shared between a click of the triangle and a click of size of size zero if there are no edges in the, in the graph, no edges in that click. So, so this satisfies that property. Um, and this uh, observation is what allowed us to uh, prove what we call our fundamental theorem. So this uh, shows the existence of a free fermion solution of the form that I described. So if we're given a Hamiltonian and a Pauli basis, there exists an objective mapping from the pa individual Pauli terms to Meyer on a quadratic operators uh, respecting the commutation relations, if and only if the frustration graph of H is the line graph uh, L of R for some root graph. And this root graph you can interpret as sort of the hopping graph of the fermions. And so just to give maybe a quick sketch of the proof, um, right, so if uh, the model has a free fermion solution and I know what it is, um, then it's easy to see that the uh, the frustration graph of the of the model has to be a line graph because by definition of how the free fermion term is anti-commute, um, we, we, it coincides with the definition of a uh, line graph neighboring, of the line graph neighboring condition. So the definitions coincide if we have a free fermion solution already. Um, however, if the graph itself is a line graph, what we can do is we can associate each uh, a fermion to each click in the Krauss decomposition of the line graph. And we give each Pauli operator in the Hamiltonian the two fermions corresponding to its clicks. And so this is guaranteed to associate two uh, fermions to each Pauli in such a way that Pauli is only anti-commute if um, they share a Meyer on a mode. And so this actually gives a free fermion solution from the fact that the, the, uh, the Hamiltonian has a line graph, uh, frustration graph. And so line graphs have an extensive characterization. And one really interesting characterization is uh, this forbidden subgraph characterization given by Beneke. So a graph is a line graph if and only if no subset of its vertices induces one of the following uh, finitely sized forbidden induced subgraphs. So there are precisely nine uh, graphs such that if any subset of the vertices induces one of these graphs, then the graph is automatically not a line graph. And this is, um, so we're a minimal, this is a complete set. So, uh, so I don't need any more forbidden subgraphs other than these nine to show that um, a graph is or is not a line graph. And uh, so we can think about these nine sort of anti-commutation structures as being finite sort of size obstruction to a free fermion solution. Um, so this kind of shows that uh, the obstructions that we can have to a free fermion solution of the form that I described are, are finite. Um, however, uh, so 
some of these uh, forbidden subgraphs contain what we call twin vertices. And so twin vertices are vertices which share neighborhoods. So uh, the red vertices here highlighted um, all have the same neighborhood as the other red vertices. And this will allow us to sort of play a trick that allows to get around the injectivity condition of the free fermion solution that I specified before. Um, and so if uh, these vertices remain twin vertices in the full frustration graph, um, we can actually get around, we can actually use that to remove these uh, obstructions. So as I said, a, twin, a pair of twin vertices is a set of vertices which share the same neighborhood. So we can consider this four cycle model. Um, and we can see that it has twin vertices uh, at the corners and, and opposite corners are twin, we can call them twin vertices. So uh, in this case, Y1, Y4 and Y2, Y3 have the same operators in the model that they, they mutually anti-commute with. And so what that means is that the product of the two operators, Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4 is a symmetry of the model. It commutes with every term in the Hamiltonian, including themselves. And uh, when we fix an eigenspace of that symmetry, uh, we can replace one term with another one in that eigenspace, thereby removing it uh, from the graph. And so this gives a smaller graph, uh, which we can write. So yeah, as I just said, uh, the vertices have the same neighbor, their product mutes, and so we can fix a symmetry to remove them. And um, right, and so this allows us to remove them. And then for the forbidden subgraphs that I described before, um, this will allow us to actually remove the forbidden subgraph if those twins are wired into the graph in the same, uh, in the, in the same way for the global graph. So except for the uh, complete graph on three vertices, the root graph of any line graph is unique. So except for this uh, claw graph, the K13 graph and the K3 graph, which both have the same line graph given by K3, um, all line graphs have a unique root. And uh, so this implies that the single qubit has a non-unique fermionization, but this is the only time this happens. And this is the fermionization of say the honeycomb qubit model. And if two graphs are, another unique result is that if two graphs are edge isomorphic with more than four vertices, then they are also vertex isomorphic. And the vertex isomorphism is itself unique. So what this implies is that if I have a hopping graph like the one on the left here for free fermion model and coefficients are, uh, such that there is a symmetry of the model which preserves, um, which preserves computation relations, then if the uh, free fermion hopping graph has more than four nodes, then any such symmetry must also be a symmetry of the single particle Hamiltonian. And so just to uh, sort of complete our characterization of symmetries, if we have a Hamiltonian the Pali basis, uh, we're sort of interested in the set of symmetries which are products of Hamiltonian terms and commute with every Hamiltonian term. Um, and we will call these root graph symmetries. And so it turns out that the, the line graph structure uh, tightly constrains these kinds of symmetries, the ones that are specified by the Hamiltonian algebra. And so there are sort of three flavors of these symmetries. Uh, one of them we've already encountered, twin vertices. Uh, the other is cycles in the root graph. And the last one is the fermionic parity operator. Um, and just to sort of see how cycles and parity end up being symmetries, uh, we consider the adjacency matrix of a line graph. And we use the fact that the adjacency matrix factorizes into the uh, edge vertex incidence matrix of the line graph. And so this, this matrix has an element which is one uh, if the vertex J belongs to the edge I and zero otherwise. And so graphical symmetries are defined as the vectors which are in the kernel of the adjacency matrix mod two. <laughs> And uh, there are two cases, so this is only true mod two. Um, so either the vector is itself in the kernel of the transpose, uh, in which case the uh, vector corresponds to a set of terms which have even degree, a cycle or a, um, a product of cycles, or uh, the vector is such that under the action of B transpose, the vector is mapped to the kernel of B. And what this implies is that B transpose V has to be the all ones vector and so this is a subset of terms that touches every, um, uh, sorry, it's a subset of uh, vertices that has odd degree on every vertex in the root graph. And so this is, you can think of as the fermionic parity operator. It's the product of all of the fermions on the hopping graph. And so this is also going to be a symmetry of the model. And so uh, we have to figure out how to incorporate these symmetries into the, into the free fermion solution because even though 
what I said preserves the commutation relations between Hamiltonian terms, it doesn't necessarily preserve the products between them. Um, and to see that I can change, note that I can change the sign of uh, you know, my, my image of the free fermion solution um, without changing commutation relations. And this is given by exchanging what I'm calling J1 and J2 in the free fermion mapping. And so we can think about this as an orientation of the root graph, right? As I said, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not fixed by the commutation relations between the pallies. And so what we're going to do is choose this orientation when we fix the cycle symmetry eigenvalues. So to do this, we first choose a spanning tree of the root graph. Um, and we can orient the edges of this tree arbitrarily. And that won't have any effect on the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, of the Hamiltonian of the free fermion matrix that I end up getting um, for a reason that we'll see. But it, it will have um, an effect on the uh, signs of the eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian. And this is sort of equivalent to choosing a, uh, a coordinate frame or coordinate basis for the uh, free fermion uh, coordinate system. So we choose a, a spanning tree, orient the edges arbitrarily, and then for each edge not in the spanning tree, there's a unique independent cycle in the root graph. And we're going to choose the orientation of that edge according to the sign of the uniquely associated cycle. And then finally, we may have a, a case where the parity operator is in the, in the qubit picture proportional to the identity up to a product of cycles. Um, and so it, since this is never going to happen in the free fermion picture, we may need to fix a particular parity symmetry sector of the free fermion Hamiltonian to restrict the Hamiltonian, the free fermion Hamiltonian back onto sort of the physical uh, parity subspace. Um, so just hopefully to see some examples of this, uh, we can consider the 1D nearest neighbor Hamiltonian that I talked about before, uh, including both XY and YX terms on the nearest neighbor interactions. And uh, so it also has local Zs, as I said before. This is what the frustration graph of this model looks like. Uh, I've colored the clicks uh, in the Krauss decomposition so that you can sort of see the structure. It, it retains the 1D structure, but the clicks are alternating uh, in sort of this chain-like pattern. Um, and this graph is the line graph of this, this much flatter 1D graph here. Um, and I've highlighted in red uh, the spanning tree, which is just a one-dimensional path. Uh, you can see that any edge that I keep on the uh, that I that I add from the from outside the spanning tree generates a cycle, um, and so from this uh, one-dimensional structure, we can actually recover the jordan wigner transformation, um, but we we don't need to. We can also just consider the model as being mapped directly to quadratics and Majorana operators, and it also happens to be the case that this mapping is such that all cycles are multiplied to the identity. Um, so the sort of symmetry, the orientation given by the symmetries is fixed for us by that fact. And maybe to just return to the Kataev honeycomb model. So the Kataev honeycomb model has, uh, I'll say the qubits are on the vertices and the terms are on the edges. Um, the frustration graph of the Kataev honeycomb model is the, the Kagame lattice. And the clicks here are colored blue and black. Um, so you can see that it indeed has a Krauss decomposition. And uh, interestingly, the frustration graph of the honeycomb model, which is the Kagame lattice, is again the line graph of the honeycomb graph. Um, so this is a special case where, uh, where the interaction graph is the, is the line graph of its own sort of uh, geometry. Um, and so, uh, right, and so what we can do is we can map this back onto a free fermion model on the honeycomb lattice. And uh, here again is highlighted a spanning tree in red. And the orientation of the edges outside of the spanning tree specify a symmetry sector, which is the uh, mutual eigenspace of the Paquette operators. And so this, this constitutes uh, the solution that I showed before, um, except that now all we care to keep track of is the orientations of the edges not in the spanning tree. Uh, so um, there are other examples of, of models which have free fermion solutions. So these authors proposed a modification to the 3D gauge color code called the frustrated hexagonal 3D gauge color code. Um, so each, it's a, a um, subsystem code defined on this three-dimensional geometry uh, where the faces all have uh, uh, gauge generators which are given by Xs or Zs around the face. And uh, we can see that these 1D chains are sort of the only non-commuting uh, stabilizer, or sorry, the subsystem generators of the model. And they have this alternating structure where they, they overlap by one vertex. And so both the X, the X face 
uh, antique mutes with the Z face and so on alternatingly. And this gives a set of decoupled 1D chains, which are also free Fermi unsolvable in the way that I showed before. And finally, I'll just say that we um, uh, came up with our own example of a solvable model, which we call the serpinsky hoy model. And so this is a model that's defined in the Serpinski lattice. Uh, the triangles are filled in by these three body qubit terms. Uh, the gauge operators, which are not in the Hamiltonian, but commute with every term in the Hamiltonian are given by these operators. And the frustration graph of this model describes allowed transitions in the towers of Hanoi problem. And it is also a line graph given by this graph here, uh, whose root graph is given by on the right. Um, so the model has an asymptotically constant uh, logical qubit encoding rate, uh, which is given by 11 18ths. And when we solve the spectrum of the model uh, with a local field applied, we find that there's an excited state degeneracy uh, that emerges. And as we, as we increase the size of the model, we note that this degeneracy, uh, these degeneracy crossing points approach zero. Uh, and we conjecture that this is related to the emergence of scale symmetry in the model in the infinite size limit. Okay, so just to summarize uh, this work, we gave a, a graph theoretic characterization of a wide class of free Fermi unsolvable models, true uh, solvable when the frustration graph is a line graph. Uh, the graphical symmetries correspond to the cycles and parity of the root graph, um, but there are still some characterizations to fill in. So um, we have some work on, on what we call beyond generator to generator or beyond Jordan Winger like mappings, but um, this is still relatively unexplored when, when we can't necessarily map Pauli's directly to Majorana operators. And uh, we also uh, want to look at cases where the solvability depends specifically on the Hamiltonian coefficients. So a, solv a model which is not necessarily solvable for all values of the Hamiltonian coefficients, but is sort of non-generic at, at specific critical points of the model. Um, so these are our open questions, and I'd just like to thank you for your time. Take any questions you have. Thank you very much, Adrian, for the very nice talk. Are there Ooh. questions? Let me see if there is some question online before. No, no. So I do have one question. Uh, I mean, I mean, you commented, I mean, how to use this for some color codes. So is the possibility of expressing or understanding in which situations you can write things as uh, free fermions. Does this help understanding the behavior of the code as a, as a code or? Yeah, I think so. So um, if you have a subsystem code, which is generated by uh, Hamiltonian with error suppression terms, which don't generally commute, if you know that that code is a free fermion, has a free fermion solution that's extremely helpful for understanding the energetics of the code, uh, which you, you may not have known otherwise, or you may not have been able to solve before, um, the other thing I should remark on is that the symmetries of the model are always given by this sort of class of cycles and or the parity operator. Um, and that's also very helpful for understanding uh, the stabilizer group of the code. And, um, and you know, it's possible maybe to, to figure out using um, some tricks, some helpful geometries, which may, um, I guess, suppress errors in the stabilizer generators that you don't want uh, by choosing your operator such that those generators are fixed as well. Um, so I think, yeah, this, this will be helpful for informing the design of subsystem codes with free Fermion solutions. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other question? Okay, if not, okay, let's thank Andrea again for the talk. And let's move to the next speaker, who is Laura Manchinska. And let me remind here exactly the title of the of the talk is quantum isomorphism is equivalent to equally of homomorphism counts from planar graphs. So please, Laura. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk to you guys today. And I want to tell you about quantum version of graph isomorphism problem and specifically about a combinatorial way 
to think about this. I really view these quantum isomorphisms as sitting between three different areas of study. The first one is quantum information and computing, and then quantum groups and combinatorics. So this combinatorial characterization that I want to focus on today, we obtained it together with David Robertson, but we introduced uh, this notion of quantum isomorphism and established connection to quantum groups in these previous two works. So you will also see results from them. So why do I find these quantum isomorphisms interesting? Well, um, they are a special class of non-local games. And in quantum information, we very successfully use this framework of non-local games to study entanglement and its uses uh, when it comes to distributed parties. Now there is one problem though, uh, namely that if you look at the very general non-local game and an arbitrary non-local game, then its entanglement assisted strategies are hard to analyze because they seem to lack some additional nice mathematical structure that we can take advantage of. So now one way around this is instead of looking at an arbitrary non-local game is to focus on some sort of well-behaved class of non-local games that do possess some of this nice additional mathematical structure that we can then leverage for our purposes. And I really view uh, quantum isomorphism as one such class of graphs. Okay, um, so this is my plan for today. So I will start uh, by defining what this quantum isomorphism is and give you different ways to think about it, including this combinatorial characterization. And then in the second part, time permitting, I will uh, try to give you some uh, glimpse into the proof of this combinatorial characterization. All right, let's first start with the classical concept. So two graphs are the same, uh, two graphs are isomorphic intuitively if they're just the same graph. But now more formally, uh, we would need an isomorphism map, uh, which is a bijection, uh, so function f, that takes vertices of g, two vertices of h, and it preserves the structure of the graph. So it preserves both adjacency and non-adjacency. And whenever such a map F exists, we're gonna say that two graphs are isomorphic and I'm gonna denote it using this congruence symbol. And by the way, I'm using this tilde to denote the adjacency. All right, so now this is one way to think about a graph isomorphism, but uh, there is yet another very common way to define graph isomorphism. And that is uh, in terms of its adjacency matrices of the two graphs, right? So these are zero one matrices where you place a one um, in the positions that correspond to adjacent vertices, right? And in this matrix formulation, we require uh, that there exists a permutation matrix that conjugates the adjacency matrix of one graph to that of the other. It really just gives you this correspondence of the vertices from one graph to that of the other. Okay, but now to define this quantum analog, I need yet another way to think about uh, graph isomorphism. And that is gonna be uh, provided by this interactive protocol where two provers, Alice and Bob, are gonna to try to convince referee that two graphs are the same. Now, let me uh, show you this game. And uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I've included the simpler version of this game, but we, here we need to make an assumption that the two graphs have the same number of vertices. So the game starts uh, when the referee selects two vertices of G so he takes G and G prime and he sends one vertex to Alice, another one to Bob. And then Alice and Bob need to respond with vertices from the other graph. So some, a vertex H and vertex H prime. And in order for Al our players, Alice and Bob to win, uh, they must uh, respond with vertices that are related in the same way as their input vertices were related. So what, does, uh, what do I mean by related in the same way? Well, if you take two vertices from an arbitrary graph, uh, then these could be the same, this could, these vertices could be the same, or they could be adjacent, or they could be distinct and non-adjacent vertices, right? So this relation takes three different values. Okay. So for example, if Alice and Bob receive adjacent vertices of G, then they would need to respond with adjacent vertices from graph H. All right, and uh, so our players, um, they are trying to collaborate. Uh, they are uh, trying to win this game together and they want to maximize their chances of winning, uh, but they're not allowed to talk to each other after they have received these vertices G and G prime. However, they know the two graphs, so they might have met before the start of the game and agreed on some strategy that they are gonna use in order to maximize their chances of winning. 
All right. Now, uh, the way we've designed this game, and it's not hard to show, uh, is that uh, if uh, the two graphs G, G and H are the same, so if they are isomorphic, um, this is equivalent to uh, conventional or classical players being able to win this game. So for instance, if the graphs are indeed the same, right, then Alice and Bob, they know the graphs, they could just agree on some uh, isomorphism mapping F uh, from vertex set of G to H, and then simply respond to, uh, according to it, right? So Alice would respond with f of g, and Bob would respond with f of g prime. And because f was an isomorphism map, uh, then all these, uh, then this relation uh, would always be the same between the input vertices as the output vertices. Okay. And uh, now this fact kind of motivated our um, definition of quantum isomorphism. And we're going to say that two graphs are quantum isomorphic if there is some strategy that allows quantum players to win this game with certainty. So irrespective of uh, these vertices G and G prime uh, that the referee selected. And this is a good point to mention that um, when I say that quantum players, then I want to work in this commuting uh, model of quantum uh, mechanics uh, rather than the more usual tensor product model. And I will highlight this uh, on the next slide as well. So now I want to uh, show you a little bit more mathematics. So, so what, what does it mean that quantum players can win uh, this game? So to, uh, to understand what does this mean for quantum players to win, we need to talk about quantum strategies. So a quantum strategy kind of consists of three different things we can think. So first one is a shared quantum state um, between Alice and Bob that they have pre-shared before the start of the game. And then uh, we can think that upon receiving uh, her input, so this vertex G, Alice is gonna choose to perform some quantum measurement on her part of the quantum state and then use the measurement outcome as her answer. Okay, and the same is gonna hold true for Bob. All right, but now uh, mathematically, how are these things described? So the shared quantum state would be a unit vector in some Hilbert space H because we are working in the tensor um, commuting model rather than the tensor product one. I just have once uh, Hilbert space H rather than HA tensor H. All right, and then uh, Alice's measurement is um, characterized uh, by some uh, POVM, so sets of positive operators uh, that add up to identity. So, uh, so there are these operators that are indexed by the vertices of the two graphs. And similarly, I have some operators, um, these measurements and operators for Bob. And then uh, locality uh, in this commuting model is, is modeled by the requirement that these two operators, that any Alice's operator must commute with any operator of Bob's. Okay, so these E's between themselves, they don't have to commute in the same for F's, but every E has to commute with every F because they are local to Alice and Bob. All right, so now uh, we have quantum strategies given by these three things. So this state psi, these operators E, and these operators F. Now if Alice and Bob play according to such a strategy, uh, then we can compute the probability that given inputs G and G prime, Alice and Bob respond with H and H prime respectively, uh, via this formula. So it's just this inner product. Notice that I have a product of E and F here rather than a tensor product, again, because I'm in the commuting model. All right. And um, now asking that there is a winning quantum strategy means that we have to find psi, these E's and F's, such that uh, whenever Alice and Bob are losing in the game, I want that the probability uh, that this probability is equal to zero, right? So, so that this inner product is equal to zero. Um, now, uh, let me, uh, now this is a good point to ask, is this quantum isomorphism really different relation graphs from the usual graph isomorphism? And since I'm giving this talk, the answer is yes, it is. Although it's not easy to find pairs of different graphs. Uh, so non-isomorphic graphs that are nevertheless quantum isomorphic. So here I uh, have an example of two such graphs. It's actually the smallest example that we know, and it comes from a general construction, um, which uh, proceeds by a reduction from this other class of non-local games called linear system games. 
so one thing that this reduction gives us is, um, is uh, families of examples of non-isomorphic graphs uh, that are quantum isomorphic. But another thing that it tells us is that this relation of quantum isomorphism is undecidable. Okay, so even if your graphs are fine, right, um, this relation is undecidable. So there's no algorithm that would allow you to test whether or not two graphs are quantum isomorphic. Okay, so now that we've seen an example, um, I want to move on to uh, this uh, connection to quantum groups, and that is provided by uh, this notion of quantum permutation matrix, which generalizes um, just uh, the notion of permutation matrix. Now in permutation, for permutation matrix, right, it's a matrix whose entries are zero or one. Now in a quantum permutation matrix, our entries, these PIJs, they are allowed to be elements from some C star algebra. And this requirement, um, of being zero or one is now replaced by the requirement that PIJ is a projection, right? So it's something that squares to itself and is self-adjoined. And in a permutation matrix, we would ask that along every row and every column, you add up to one. We have the same requirement, except that now we have to add up to this algebra identity rather than just scalar one. And um, if your C star algebra was just the algebra of complex numbers, then you recover uh, the usual notion of permutation matrix. Okay. Um, now, uh, with these quantum permutation matrices, we can obtain a characterization that says that quantum isomorphism, so two graphs are quantum isomorphic, if and only if we can find a quantum permutation matrix script P that conjugates the adjacency matrix of one graph to that of the other. Now you see that syntactically, this looks exactly the same uh, like our matrix characterization of graph isomorphism. Just instead of requiring the existence of permutation matrix, we allow for quantum permutation matrices. And then that gives you the relation of quantum isomorphism. Okay, but now let's uh, go on to this promised combinatorial characterization. And this will be uh, in terms of homomorphisms. So now a graph homomorphism from F to G is simply an adjacency preserving mapping. Okay, so you don't need to preserve non-adjacency, you only care about preserving adjacency relation. Again, this tilde denotes adjacency. Here's an example. So if we take a look at the seven cycle and we identify these two uh, blue vertices and these two red vertices, uh, then that's a graph homomorphism to a five cycle. Now, given uh, two graphs, we might not only be interested uh, of whether there exists a graph homomorphism from one to another, but also ask how many different graph homomorphisms are there? And this number is known as the number of homomorphisms and denoted uh, as HOM of F, G. So it's the homomorph the number of homomorphisms from F to G. And uh, there's a really nice uh, characterization uh, theorem by Lawless that says that actually uh, these homomorphism counts, these numbers HOM F, G, they determine a graph up to isomorphism. So two graphs, G and H, they are the same if and only if they have the same homomorphism counts from all graphs F. Okay, so one direction is obvious. If the graphs are the same, of course they have the same number of homomorphism counts from any graph F. Now, then you need to do some work to prove the other implication. And to our surprise, um, an analog of this theorem holds also for quantum isomorphism. So two graphs are quantum isomorphic if and only if they have the same number of homomorphism counts from all planar graphs. So now you don't ask uh, equality of these homomorphism counts from all graphs, but you only focus on the planar graphs. And it turns out that the relation on graphs you get magically happens to be uh, this quantum isomorphism. So uh, the reason why we find this so, so surprising is because the left-hand side and the right-hand side of, of this theorem, they seem to really reside in, in different realms, right? So this uh, quantum isomorphism, remember, it was defined as existence of um, a perfect uh, quantum strategy in a certain non-local game or interactive protocol, whereas on the right-hand side, we have a purely co a combinatorial type statement. Uh, there's no quantum, right, uh, appearing on the right-hand side of, uh, of this equivalence. Okay. And actually, um, this result um, 
fits into larger context of uh, results on homomorphism counts. So um, what you can do, uh, what people have done is you fix some class of graphs, script F, and then you ask, what is the relation on graphs do I get if I require equality of homomorphism counts uh, from this uh, class of graphs, script F, okay? So for instance, if you were uh, required homo equality of homomorphism counts from all cycles, uh, then uh, you get the relation of co-spectrality. Right? So, uh, the adjacency uh, matrices of uh, two graphs, uh, they need to have the same eigenvalues. Okay. Uh, uh, now there's a nice theorem that says that if you uh, require equality of homomorphism counts from all trees, then the relation that you get is uh, the so-called fractional isomorphism. Uh, you can see this as uh, some linear relaxation uh, of uh, graph isomorphism. People have uh, looked at this because uh, this can be tested in polynomial time. Okay, and, and there are uh, some further generalizations of this fractional isomorphism that can also be understood in terms of homomorphism counts. All right. Um, now, before I go on to the proof, the last thing I want to show you is um, how uh, we can use this um, combinatorial characterization of quantum isomorphism. So if your two graphs are quantum isomorphic, there is this natural proof or certificate of isomorphism, namely this, um, this, this quantum strategy that allows you to win this game. Right? Uh, it's, it's not, uh, it might not be efficiently specifiable, right? It could be an infinite dimensional strategy, yet uh, in, in principle, it, it exists. Right? So there, there is this proof. But now instead, imagine instead that you wanted to prove to someone that your two graphs they are not quantum isomorphic. How would you even do? Um, and in fact, in the past, um, to get some separation, we wanted to show that these two graphs that are kind of combinatorially uh, very similar, uh, they are strongly regular graphs with the same parameters, um, that they are not quantum isomorphic. Right? And then we had some elaborate argument for showing that they are not quantum isomorphic. But now with this combinatorial characterization, there's a very easy argument uh, for saying that these two graphs are not quantum isomorphic. Uh, and, it's, and it's simply uh, that we can observe um, that this graph on the left, uh, the rook graph, that it has uh, a homomorphism from the complete graph on four vertices, it, because it contains these four cliques, whereas uh, the Shirkander graph, you can check that it doesn't contain uh, a four clique on four, four vertices, so it doesn't have a homomorphism from K4. So, and K4 is planar, uh, so you have different number of uh, homomorphism counts from this planar graph K4 to the root graph as opposed to Shirkanda graph. So for this one, it's the homomorphism counts are greater than zero, right? And for this one, uh, there's zero such homomorphisms. So by this combinatorial characterization, it tells us uh, that these two graphs cannot be quantum isomorphic. So in general, whenever you have two quantum uh, two graphs that are not quantum isomorphic, uh, there must exist a certificate in the form of a planar graph uh, that has different uh, homomorphism counts from uh, your two graphs of interest. Okay, so now let me proceed to the uh, second and final part uh, where I want to tell you a little bit about the proof of how do we get this combinatorial characterization. Although on the face of it, uh, the statement has nothing to do with quantum groups, actually the proof proceeds via quantum groups. So in our previous work, we have showed that uh, we can understand this quantum isomorphism in terms of uh, the so-called quantum automorphism gr a group of a graph, QUT of G. And the main component for uh, proving our combinatorial characterization is a, to get a combinatorial description of intertwiners of this quantum automorphism group of a graph. I'm not gonna give you formal definitions because our point of departure is actually gonna be this nice theorem by Chassignol um, that says that the intertwiners, so these are just matrices um, of this quantum automorphism group can be understood um, in terms of these three very simple generators. So you start with these three matrices, U, M, and AG. So AG is the adjacency matrix of the graph U is the all ones vector, and M is this matrix that I've defined uh, uh, by, by its action on standard basis here. 
Okay, but it's just some fixed matrix. All right, so you take these three matrices and then you see what can you generate if you consider the operations of matrix product, tensor product, complex conjugate, uh, transpose, and taking linear combination. Okay, and Chasignol's theorem says that this gives you the set of all intertwiners of quantum automorphism group graph. And what we want to do is to have now a combinatorial way of understanding this set of matrices. And this will be provided by uh, what we call by or what Lovas calls bilabeled graphs. So an LK bilabeled graph is a triple, where the first thing is just some graph F, and then I have an L tuple of left vertices and a K tuple of right vertices. So graph together with two sets of distinguished vertices. Okay, here's an example. This is a two-two bilabeled graph because I have two left vertices and two uh, right vertices. And, and here um, is how I would draw it, right? So we know how to draw a graph. We first draw the graph, and then we indicate uh, these left and right vertices by what I, we call wires. So these are these thinner gray lines. So, so my left, left vertices are indicated by left wires, where the left wires the first left wire starts on the very top and then it goes to the first left vertex, so two. And then my second wire uh, goes to my second left vertex, so number one. And then uh, similarly to, for the right vertices. So the topmost right wire, it goes to the first uh, right vertex and the second goes to the second. All right. So I explained you how to, how to draw them already. And here are three more examples of, um, of drawings of these bilabeled graphs that I have suggestively named U arrow, M arrow, and A arrow. Okay, so these are just bilabeled graphs on one vertex for the first two and uh, two vertices on the, for the last example. Okay. Um, now, uh, now to homomorphism counts, okay? So, Let's, uh, let me explain this on a one-one bi bilabeled graph uh, so that things are a little bit easier. So if I have a graph G and a one-one bilabeled graph, so I have some graph F with one distinguished left vertex and one distinguished right vertex. Okay. So then a G homomorphism ma matrix of this bilabeled graph F is gonna be a matrix whose UV entry, so U and V are vertices of G is given by the number of homomorphisms from the graph F, from this bilabeled graph, to G, where I map for, uh, this my uh, left vertex uh, A to U and right vertex B to V. So what I've done here is I have essentially taken all homomorphisms from F to G and I partitioned them according, according to images of uh, these left and right vertices, okay? So uh, if the left vertex is mapped to U and right vertex mapped to B, then that's gonna contribute to the UV entry. Okay? So, but if I summed up all the entries in this matrix, then I would get the, num the total number of homomorphisms from F to G. Let's see an example. So here uh, I have my bilabeled graph K2 uh, on two vertices with one left vertex and one right vertex. Okay. And let's think about what its uh, G homomorphism matrix is. So I said the UV entry is equal to the number of homomorphism, homomorphisms that maps vertex A, so the one to U and two to V. Okay, so now because one and two are adjacent vertices and then I'm cutting graph uh, homomorphisms, if U and V are not adjacent, then I have zero such graph homomorphism because graph homomorphism preserve adjacency. Okay? Uh, however, if uh, U and V are adjacent, uh, then I get precisely one homomorphism because K2 has only two vertices. If I specify where vertex one and two go, then I've fully specified my graph homomorphism. Okay, so now I get a matrix that has one precisely in entries uh, that correspond to adjacent vertices. So this matrix is just the adjacency matrix of my graph. Okay? So this homomorphism counting matrix for this particular bilabeled graph gives me the adjacency matrix. Okay? 
And it turns out that similarly, uh, I can get uh, these other two matrices uh, from Chassignol's characterization of intertwiners, this U and M, by counting homomorphisms from these two special um, bilabeled graphs that I showed you before. Okay, so now that we've understood, uh, we've given a combinatorial understanding to these uh, building blocks, my starting blocks in Chassinel's characterization, what remains to do is to have a combinatorial characterization of these operations of matrix product, conjugate transpose, and so on. Right? So I'm just gonna show you uh, the one for matrix product. So this says uh, that the product of uh, of uh, two homomorphism counting matrices, I can see it as a homomorphism counting matrix of yet another graph. So what do I, what do, I do here? So I take my two bilabeled graphs, I draw them next to each other, and then I join these uh, left and right wires together and I contract them and thus obtain um, a new uh, bilabeled graph. And it turns out that this, uh, uh, this uh, this relation holds if I defined my operation uh, this way. Okay, and you can similarly get uh, this uh, combinatorial characterization for these other operations of a tensor product and uh, complex, uh, complex conjugate transpose. Okay, so now if we, we have combinatorial understanding of both these operations and our starting blocks, so then it remains to say, what are the class of bilabeled graphs uh, that uh, these generate, okay? I'm not gonna go uh, via formal definition. I'm just gonna uh, tell you intuitively. It turns out that the class that you get is so what we call planar bilabeled graphs. So not only uh, the graph needs to be planar itself, but also this full drawing of wires needs to be uh, planar. So you need to be able to draw it without any crossings of wires and edges or wires and wires. So no crossing. Um, so this is um, the class of graphs you get. And then informally speaking, uh, the, these intertwiners of quantum automorphism group are given uh, by then the linear span of these homomorphism matri matrices, of these planar bilabeled graphs. So things that you can draw without crossings. Okay, so, and this is my very last slide. So we, we saw that you can uh, think of this uh, graph isomorphism in terms of this interactive protocol. And that was our point of departure for defining quantum isomorphism of graphs. And then uh, we saw um, that one way to think about this quantum isomorphism is in terms of existence of this quantum permutation matrix that conjugates adjacency matrix of one graph to that, that of the other, and that provided us a link to uh, quantum groups that study such um, quantum permutation matrices. And uh, also we have a link to combinatorics where we say that actually uh, two graphs being quantum isomorphic is the same as requiring equality of homomorphism counts from all planar graphs. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that was all I wanted to tell you today. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, are there questions? Okay, there are at least two, so Fred. Uh, yeah, thanks for the great talk. I uh, had one small technical question, uh, which is I, I didn't completely understand the adjacency matrix condition with the quantum permutation matrix. So is this over uh, any, because these quantum permutation matrices, they take value in a C star algebra. Is this over any C star algebra or any finite algebra or, or something like that. So that was the one question. And the other question was, um, do you have any idea what happens when you go to the tensor product model instead of the commuting operator model? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so uh, the second question I can answer very quickly. So we, we don't have, uh, so, okay, maybe I'm wrong in being uh, very short. So if, uh, if you are, uh, so I have this QC here for commuting, right? Quantum commuting. If I just had a Q, so it's a tensor product model, uh, then you can have this first theorem, uh, but then you need to require uh, that the C star algebra uh, is uh, an algebra of matrices of some size. Um, so if you have this quantum permutation matrix whose entries 
are matrices of some size, not fixed size, but some size. Uh, but we, we're not aware of any kind of combinatorial characterization for, uh, in terms of these homomorphism counts for, for the tensor product model. And actually, we know that if uh, there were to exist uh, a characterization of that type, then this class of graphs would have to be uh, a very uh, kind of some, it wouldn't be some nice class of graphs. Uh, let's put it that way. Um, all right, and so that was for the second question. Does, does, does that make sense? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, and now for the first question. Um, yes, uh, good catch. I didn't go into any details about this. Um, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, the question is, how do I even think about this equality? Because I seem to be multiplying together objects of a different type. Is that, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, so, yes, so this adjacency matrix, right, is a zero-one matrix, whereas this matrix script P is a matrix uh, whose entries are elements from some C-star algebra, right? But of course, their dimension, like uh, the number of these entries still match, right? This is an N by N matrix, and these are N by N matrices as well, where N is the number of vertices in your graph. Uh, so then you kind of you just try to do multiplication as if, as if, uh, of, of two matrices as if you could. And then you notice that, well, I can multiply algebra elements with scalars, right? So all, all you will have to do is multiply algebra element, uh, elements with scalars and, and take some uh, sums of them. And, and algebra, of course, is, is closed under those operations. Does that help? Yeah, okay, thanks. And, and if, if I understood correctly, then, uh, so here it actually matters for the commuting operator versus tensor products with, over what class of C-star algebras you, uh, you do this. Uh, right, yes, or? so for the commuting, yeah. yes, co correct, yes. For, so for the commuting one, we allow an arbitrary C-star algebra. Okay, and thanks. That's, that's very important, yeah, thank you. Okay, Ion, I think you had a question. Yes, hi, Laura. So my question hi. is about these examples um, of uh, graphs which are um, uh, quantum isomorphic but non-isomorphic. So it has two parts. First one is how small can these examples be? And second, the second one is the one, the one, the one that you showed coming from these this BCS things. Um, do you have a, a, like a non-planar witness graph for, for this one, you know, using your theorem? Yes. Uh, okay, so... As I said, uh, that example I showed you is the smallest we know. I would be happy to have an example that I can fit both graphs on a single slide. Um, right. Um, uh, but so this has 24 vertices. And we actually know uh, that um, I think uh, you cannot get a, an example smaller uh, than with 16 vertices. So we, we don't know that this is the smallest example possible, but we know that there's not gonna be like a very small example of such graphs, like with five vertices that you can easily draw and so on. Um, and um, about uh, the planar graph. So, uh, oh, you're asking what is the witness here? Uh, yes. Jan, yeah. is, is that yeah. correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, that is, uh, uh, that is K33. So, sorry, not K33, of course. Um, okay, I, I cannot tell you actually. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to know if whether you know you have one and how how simple it is. I mean, that's. Uh... Yes. Yes, actually, maybe maybe we don't know one actually. But but let let me get back to you. Uh, uh, Thanks a lot. Offline. Okay, th thank you very much. I think it's time to move. So thank you, Laura, a lot for your talk. Okay, before moving to the next speaker, I forgot to tell to the online speakers that, okay, I mean, we have a medal for them. Uh, I mean, just to, as a recognition of the, they have in, invited the speakers, and let me just show it to the camera. And okay, you will get it by, by post mail. Uh, and okay, I will give 
this one to, to you. And I leave it here. I have, of course, uh, so I mean, so that you can take it now. And okay, next speaker is Ion Akita, and he's uh, going to be on site. He's just here. And okay, is let me tell you the exact title of the talk. Is here uh, some applications of free spectra hydra to quantum information theory. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David, and uh, thanks, thanks to the organizers for uh, allowing me to present these, these results in a, such a prestigious conference. Uh, so I, I'm going to tell you about uh, some work, which is a series of uh, uh, four, soon five papers, uh, most of them done in, in collaboration with uh, Andreas Blum, who is, uh, who is in Copenhagen. Um, and this, is, this, this work is, uh, is kind of a long, uh, a long project about um, a connection between two, um, two different, completely different areas. Uh, so one of them are some, some problems, some, some, a bunch of problems in quantum information theory, and today I will focus on uh, compatibility, but um, we have other examples where, where these techniques apply. And the other, the other field is, um, is a subfield of what, what, is known, what is now known as free convexity, which is, uh, which is some kind of uh, you know, uh, linear algebra uh, uh, optimization theory. Uh, kind of thing. Fortunately, I don't have the. Ah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Thanks. Good. So, uh, so this is the plan. This is the plan of the talk. So, as I said, I will I will tell, focus about one one example in quantum information theory, which is incompatibility of quantum measurements. And so then I will, I will tell you what these, uh, these uh, geometrical objects, what, what these spectrohedra and then what free spectrohedra are. And in the third part, I will connect these two, uh, these two, uh, these two things and, uh, and, uh, and give you the, uh, the main correspondence between uh, what happens on one side and what happens on the other side. And uh, if time permits, I will, I will give you some, some proof ideas. And with the hope that, you know, maybe, uh, maybe I mean, we, we think that this connection is, uh, is, is, uh, is fairly general, so with the hope that, you know, maybe you can come with, your, uh, with another problem in quantum information theory, which can be rephrased in, uh, in the setting of free spectra hydra, and, uh, you know, maybe this will, uh, uh, you know, you can, uh, you can use results from free spectra hydra to prove stuff in quantum information or vice versa. So this is, this is how we, we kind of see these, uh, this, this body of work, like uh, building bridges between these, um, these two fields. Okay, so... Um, let me start with something that you are uh, familiar with, but just to fix some notations. So, uh, quantum measurements and compatibility of quantum measurements. So, by quantum measurement, I will mean simply mean uh, uh, a POVM. So, what is a POVM? A POVM is just a bunch of uh, of self-adjoint operators which are positive and sum up to the identity. And uh, you know, the the Born rule tells you that if you measure a quantum state rho with an apparatus described by by a POVM, then you will get outcome A with probability trace of uh, rho times A. So, uh, so this is how uh, how I will model measurements, and uh, this is the main definition. The, so, two two measurements, two two POVMs A and B, are called compatible if you can find a third uh, POVM C, which is now indexed, you know, by uh, by by uh, by two indices I and J, and uh, with the property that uh, the POVMs A and B are the marginals of uh, of C. So, what what I mean here is that. Uh, if I sum the, uh, you know, if I take the row sums of C, then I recover the A's, and if I take the column sums of C, then I recover the B's, okay? So this is what, what I mean by two compatible measurements, and of course, this, this definition generalizes to more than two, so if you have G of them, then, you know, uh, you call uh, G P of VMs compatible if you find uh, a P of VMC, which now has a much larger index set, so the index set is the, you know, the Cartesian product of the in the indices for the for the for the for the original POVMs with the same marginal properties. Okay, I, I will not write it down because it's uh, it's cumbersome. Good. So what, what does this mean? Basically, compatibility means that you know some some measurement devices are compatible if I can measure them at the same time. You know, this is not always possible in quantum mechanics, like position and momentum being the uh, the uh, the typical example. But this means that you know if I want to measure if I want to measure uh, these. Uh, oops, these devices, uh, these, these devices here on the left at the same time, uh, uh, you know, usually it's not impossible, but if, if the devices are compatible, this means that I can come up with, an, with, a, with another device, with a much more complicated, larger device, this C device here, the joint measurement, 
then I measure my particle, and then I can classically post-process the, the, the result, I mean, the, you know, which, which light bulb lights up here uh, on the device C. I can post-process this result and, uh, and give you the, uh, the corresponding outcomes for the, for the measurements on the, on the left-hand side here. Okay? So this is the idea, like, uh, measurements are compatible if we, one can measure them at the same time. And, uh, you know, there are many examples, like trivial POVMs, so, you know, scalar POVMs. If, uh, you know, commuting POVMs are compatible because you can just, you know, if you have uh, commuting operators AI and BJ, you can just define this CIJ as the product AI times BJ, because they commute in general, of course, you cannot do this. And, uh, you know, this is uh, in the case where one of the PM POVM is projective, then this is like, actually equivalent to compatibility. Uh, this, uh, this, commu this, this commuting condition. But oh, in general, it's, more, it's, a, it's a more intricate condition than commutativity. Okay, and can you find the same notion of compatibility for other uh, types of quantum devices like channels or uh, this, this, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very general notion. Okay, so, so this was, this was uh, compatibility. Now let me uh, tell you about noise. So uh, if you have, uh, actually it turns out that if you have, if you start with some, uh, some incompatible quantum measurement devices, uh, if you can, you can render them compatible by adding noise, by making them worse. And this is, uh, this is how it goes. So first, let me tell you how do you, what do I mean by adding noise? Uh, so you see here, if you, have a, if you have a POVM with two outcomes, so this is defined by two operators E and identity minus E, then I'm adding, I'm, I'm saying I'm adding noise to this, uh, to this uh, POVM, simply by, I'm, I'm taking a, a convex combination between my original POVM with, you know, this parameter S, and the trivial POVM, identity over two, identity over two, which just corresponds to uh, flipping a coin. So, you know, this, this POVM doesn't have any, um, doesn't give you any information about the state you're measuring. You just, it's just flipping a coin and throwing the, uh, the, the state uh, in, the, in the bin. So, so adding noise meaning uh, taking a convex combination between your original POVM and these, uh, these trivial POVMs. And for instance, there is a fact which has been known for, uh, for some time that if I take, you know, these convex combinations with, uh, with S equals half, so, you know, take the, uh, the, the average between, between a, a POVM and, its, um, and the trivial POVM, then, and, and then any two POVMs uh, will become compatible. And again, this, you can see this by, you know, you can actually write down what is this joint, joint POV. So the idea is that noisy POVMs are compatible if you add enough noise. And this, this leads me to, the, uh, to, uh, to this definition here, which is, which is one of the, the, the main definitions of this, of this talk, uh, the definition of the compatibility region. So, so this compatibility, compatibility region is a set uh, indexed by two numbers, G and D. So G is the number of measurements and D is the Hilbert space dimension. Uh, whoops. So what is this, uh, this set? So this is the set of parameters S of the noise amount S, such that if I start, oops, okay, I'm wrong. If I start from any, uh, any G tuple of of, uh, of effect, so here I'm just looking at POVMs with two elements, so these, these are just associated to one operator E. Uh, so if I start for any, any G tuple of two outcome POVMs, adding, adding noise one minus S renders them compatible. Okay, so notice the, the, quant the, the, uh, the quantifier here for all quantum effects, right? So let me, uh, let me spell this out. Here, here I call the definition, and, and, and some basic properties of the set. So the set is convex by, it's, uh, you can see it from the definition. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, it always, so in the case G equals two, I, I have a picture here. It contains this point one zero, meaning that, you know, uh, any POVM is compatible with, with trivial POVMs. Then uh, an important, another important fact, that it does not contain the point one 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 one, because there are POVMs which are not compatible. And, uh, you know, it, it has been studied a lot in, uh, in the quantum information literature. It has been computed for a small number of, uh, uh, so, so, so a few, few measurements and small dimensions. And what, why, why is the set interesting? Why people care about the set? Because this set is kind of a universal set in, in quantum mechanics. So, and it, it, it tells you how much incompatibility you have in quantum mechanics when you're looking at G measurements uh, in, the, in, Hilbert, in, in, in Hilbert space dimension D. So it's a kind of a, you know, it's a kind of a fundamental, you know, fundamental constant in quantum mechanics tell you how, how incompatible this, uh, this theory is. Okay, so then, uh, then, uh, then people have tried to, to compute the set and uh, for, for all uh, number of measurements and Hilbert space, and Hilbert space dimension. Okay, so, so this is the set, uh, this is what I want you to keep in mind. Our goal would be to understand the set better. And now I will switch gears and tell you about uh, spectrohedra and free spectrohedra. 
Okay, so, so the starting point for, for spectrohedra is polyhedra, these this, 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 this things you, you all know. So these are, you know, these are sets which are defined as uh, intersection of, uh, uh, intersection of, halves, of, of halves, half spaces. So you know, it had, it had, it had these, these, uh, these, uh, these uh, facets. And there is a natural generalization of these polyhedra which are called spectrohedra, where the idea is that in, instead of uh, regarding intersection of these half spaces, I will, I will, I will use inequalities which are uh, positive semi-definite inequalities. So, uh, so a, a spectrohedron is just a set of points in RG, such that this inequality here, so this smaller oracle here, this is the, uh, uh, the order relation for matrices, so you know, the, the difference of these matrices being positive semi-definite. This is called a uh, linear matrix inequality. So you see, instead of having these uh, you know, coordinate by coordinate inequalities, I'm having these uh, inequalities which are given in terms of matrices. And of course, you, know, you, can, uh, you, can, you can get around things, and you know, the typical example is uh, what happens when you, when you look at this the case where these matrices uh, AI are the Pauli matrices. Uh, then you get this inequality. If you spell out the condition, then you get this inequality. And here you recognize, you all recognize the, uh, uh, the block ball, right? So you get a sphere, okay? So sp uh, spectrohedra can be round, right? Whereas polyhedra only are, you know, they have uh, finitely many uh, extreme points. Good, so a spectrohedra, sorry, so a spectrohedra is just an object defined by these uh, linear matrix inequalities. And now, you know, in, uh, you know, in operator algebra, what people like to do is, you know, you have such a, you have such a definition and, you know, instead of multiplying the AIs with scalars, uh, small xi, why not multiply them with matrices uh, and using the tensor product, right? So this is, this is what a free spectrohedron is. So a free, spe a free spectrohedron is a, is a bunch of levels. It's defined as a union of, of matrix levels where the matrix level N now is the set, instead of having, you know, points in RG, now we have G tuples of self-adjoint matrices of size N, which satisfy basically the same inequality as before, okay? So it's, you know, it's a, uh, it's uh, it blow, blowing up this inequality to matrix levels and looking at all the matrix level, uh, levels at the same time. Uh, great, so uh, this is the definition of free spectrohedra. Let me give you two examples. Uh, so the first one is the, is the matrix cube and the second one is the matrix diamond. And um, so here's the definition of the, of the matrix cube. So uh, it's a union of levels and each level are G tuples of matrices such that each matrix is a contraction. Okay. And, uh, you know, if you look at level one, so if these X's are just scalars, then you see you get the unit ball of the L infinity norm, so you get the cube. This is why this is called the matrix cube. And notice also that this definition that I gave you here, it's not precisely of the form, you know, uh, of, uh, of this form here, right? But if you think about it for a moment, you can, you can do this by using some, uh, some diagonal matrices, which are of size 2G. I mean, this is, uh, you, can just, uh, you can just work it out. So this is indeed a free spectrohedron, and it's defined by these, uh, by these matrices Ki. Okay, so that's the cube. Remember that the cube has a level one, this, this, the unit ball of the L infinity norm. Let's look at the, uh, the dual of this, because duality is, uh, is an important part of this theory. So the, unit, uh, the, the dual of the cube is the, uh, um, is, the, you know, is the unit ball of the L1 norm. And uh, the spectrohedron built on top of this, the free spectrohedron built on top of this, is called the matrix diamond, because you know if you take the dual in, in, in R2, the dual looks like a looks like a diamond, and it's defined by again by by a bunch of inequalities, uh, which look a bit like the definition of the L1 norm, right? So uh, the level n is G tuples of n by n matrices, such that for all possible sign choices in, that I put in front of the matrices, so the epsilon is a, epsilon i here, I get I get something which is more than the identity. Okay, so here you see I have, uh, I have more conditions. I have uh, two to the power G conditions because I have to take all, all sign traces. So since I have these many conditions, now you know, this, this is indeed a free spectrohedron, but defined by matrices now Li, which are you know, of size uh, two to the G, whereas before I had matrices of size two times G. Okay. So, so, okay, so these are, these are the, the, uh, uh, the examples of free spectrohedron that we'll be looking at. And uh, now I want, to, uh, I want to look at a problem, which, uh, different problem, which is inclusion of free spectrohedra. So I have two free spectrohedra. Defined, the first one is defined by a, by a g-tuple of matrices uh, A1 up to AG, and the second one is defined by a different g-tuple of matrices B1 up to, up to BG. Of course, these matrices don't have to have the same size. Right, so uh, of course we say that, you know, DA is contained in, in DB if we have inclusion at all levels, because, you know, DA is the stack of all these levels, so I want that the inclusion holds for all levels N. And of course, no, if I have inclusion at all levels, I have inclusion at level one. 
which are in level one, you have these convex sets, which are used to. But I would be interested in the converse. So what can I say if I have, uh, if I have this condition here? Of course, in general, I don't have this, this other implication because, you know, this inclusion might break at level three or whatever. But it turns out that uh, under some technical assumption, I can have this condition uh, if, uh, if, if I shrink enough the, the, the guy on the left-hand side, right? And this, this how much do I have to shrink in order to have always this condition? This defines a set, which is the set of inclusion constants. So this is the definition. So you're fixing A, you're fixing the A, and the set of the in inclusion constants for the free spectrohedron the A is a set of parameters S, such that for all other choices of the spectrohedron B, so here I have again for all spectrohedron DB, if I have inclusion at level one, then I have inclusion at all levels uh, if I shrink uh, the A by this S uh, vector, right? So this S, you know, this S dot DA means that, you know, uh, the first component is shrunk by uh, S1, the second one by S2, et cetera. So this again, this is, a, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a convex set and this has been studied a lot in optimization theory. Um, and it's a bit like the starting point of this theory. So this is why people have been interested in this because it gives some, some you know, some uh, semi, some semi-definite relaxations of uh, of some uh, hard optimization problems. So, um, so this was, I mean, the the the, the, the interest for this uh, for these objects comes from uh, optimization. Okay. So uh, uh, in uh, in relation, we, we we shall be interested in the matrix diamond, so not in the cube, which has been historically the most important one, but in the diamond, it's kind of dual. But it turns out that the inclusion constants are, are, uh, are the same. As it's, uh, it's by, by duality, you can, you can show that the inclusion constants for the cube are the same as the inclusion constants for the diamond. Good, so that uh, wraps it up for the, um, uh, for the spectral hero. Now let me tell you what's the bridge between the, these, two, uh, these, two, uh, these two worlds, okay? So here is the result. Here is our main theorem from three years ago. So uh, let's start. Let's start. Uh, let's start with a G tuple with a G tuple of uh, of quantum effects E i, and uh, then I can I can build this free spectrohedron defined by the matrices two e two e minus identity. So you know it's uh, it's the same definition, but instead of the matrices A i here, I put this two e i minus identity. So these actually are the observables corresponding to the P of M's, and this is the definition. I will have uh, so it has, this is sorry the, the theorem. It has two parts. First part uh, builds, says that these uh, the two problems, so compatibility and inclusion of spectrohedra are the same, and the second part tells you about the inclusion constants, but let's, let's focus on the first part first. So the first part says that these matrices E, I, which I started with, are quantum effects, so are between you know, zero, and, uh, zero and identity, if and only if I have inclusion at level one of what? Of the matrix diamond inside this thing defined, this fifth spectrohedron defined by the matrices. So level one inclusion is the same thing as the, the matrices being measurements. And the interesting point is the second one, says that uh, moreover, if I want the, the measurements to be compatible, so the measurements being compatible is equivalent to the stronger, of course, inclusion at all levels. Okay? And uh, so, so basically this is, you know, this is, this, this, so this, these are equivalences, so level one, it's just being measurements, and all levels means being compatible measurements. Well, I, I, I want to skip this because I'm running out of time, so we have something for the intermediate levels, but uh, let's, let's not waste time on this. Uh, and so moreover, so I, I've told you this equivalence, but moreover, the, the set of these, um, uh, this compatibility region gamma, which is defined, you know, how much noise do I have to add to any measurements to make them compatible, is the same thing as the set delta, which was, which was the set of inclusion constants for, uh, for the matrix diamond and the matrix cube. These things are the same. Uh, good. So, so this basically this this theorem builds this this complete you know this equivalence between these two different worlds and also the uh, the equality of these these sets characterizing robustness let's say of the of the two uh, definitions and uh, you know I, I've just told you the story for uh, measurements with two outcomes but the same thing works for measurements with more outcomes it also works in the setting of uh, of GPTs that Ludovico talked about a bit in his in his talk uh, earlier this week. So it's a, it, it, it goes through many 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 different generalizations of these um, of these objects. Good. And now, uh, okay. So so what? <laughs> we have an equivalence. We have established an equivalence between two problems. But of course, now you know people have been thinking about these free spectrohedron for a long time. So they have proven a lot lots of theorems. Here are two, two two recent ones. They have examples of points in the inclusion constant set. Uh, they also have computed the inclusion constant set in some cases. 
And people also, on the other side, people have thought about compatibility a lot. They, you know, they have solved small cases, they have techniques such as quantum cloning to proving that, uh, that things are compatible. And now since we have this bridge, we can, you know, we can put all these things together and you know, get, new, get, get new results on both sides. And uh, let me uh, just showcase one of the results that we have obtained. We have completely characterized these sets, so the set of, uh, of uh, you know, inclusion constants and, and uh, compatibility region uh, for all G, but when the dimension is large enough. So if, if you give me you know, uh, five measurements, then I can tell you that in dimension two to the power, I don't know, uh, 10, uh, the inclusion, the, uh, the, the, uh, the compatibility region and this inclusion constants are given by this quarter circle, so this, uh, this unit ball of the L2, uh, L2 norm. So, uh, so this is an example, I mean, we have, we have m many more results, but maybe this is the most, uh, the most striking one that we can obtain with these techniques. Uh, good, uh, I have two more minutes, I guess. Let me, uh, let me tell you about proof ideas. Uh, and here the hope is that, you know, if you, if, you, if you look at these proof ideas, maybe you can uncover more, you know, more, more problems in quantum information theory which have a corresponding uh, equivalent formulation in terms of spectrocity. So basically the workhorse of the proof is this result uh, uh, by Helton, Klepp and McCullough from uh, 10 years ago, which tells us what does it mean to have this inclusion at, at, a, at a given level. So if I have uh, you know, a g-tuple of matrices A, a g-tuple of matrices B, then I have inclusion at level N between these two spectrohedra. If, uh, if the, you know, the unital linear map, which is, uh, I mean, I, I, I have to define it in terms of operator systems, so, you know, uh, it's a, you know, so I have the, the, the unique you know, linear map, which maps you know, the identity to identity and the AIs to BIs, is N positive. So you know this, this notion of n positivity. It can you know you, you know it for, for for matrix algebras, but it can be can be uh, defined in a more general setting of operator spaces and uh, 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 of operator systems. Sorry, and uh, you know n, n positivity of this map is equivalent to inclusion at level n. And you know in quantum, may, many things in quantum information theory are based on you know what is positive versus completely positive, what is separable versus. Uh, versus general states, and this, this, so all, all these things can be defined uh, in terms of positivity versus complete positivity. So basically, this is, uh, this is how we make the connections. So I suspect, this is why we suspect that this kind of, uh, this kind of formulations in terms of free spectrohedra will, uh, should appear uh, in, similar play, in, in, in different places in, in, in quantum information theory, because we have this strong connection between degrees of positivity of linear maps and, uh, and inclusion of, uh, of spectrohedra. Uh, I will skip, uh, I will skip the, the technicalities, maybe to show you uh, an example of, uh, uh, of these, uh, you know, uh, in uh, the compatibility region, and to showcase the, some matrices which appeared like uh, an hour ago. <laughs> so these, uh, these, these, uh, this, this was in the first talk of this, uh, this session, these, Mar these Marana operators. So what, what are these? Uh, these are uh, anti-commuting self-adjoint unitary matrices. And uh, you can always build them. You need to go into exponential dimension in, 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 in their number, but uh, they always exist. You, can, you have this construction with, with Pauli matrices that was presented earlier. And uh, okay, so these, these things exist. And what do we claim? We claim that these things, so the, the measurement operators given by, you know, you take these matrices plus identity over two. So basically you take the, these are the observables. So the, the observables corresponding to these matrices are the most incompatible uh, 2k plus one tuple of measurements in, in, in this dimension, in, the, in dimension two to the k. So, this is, so, so, so these Majoran observables are the most incompatible observables that you can, you can ever measure uh, in dimension d to the power k. So you know, this is, uh, uh, this is, this is a, a, a consequence of, uh, of our results. And, uh, and with this, I would like to, to flash bit before your eyes the, uh, again the results, uh, the, the results we have obtained and to maybe state one more time the theorem. So there is an equivalence on the left-hand side of two things in quantum information, on the right-hand side, two things in, in free spectrohedron theory. So uh, some matrices being quantum effects is the same thing as having uh, level one inclusion between the matrix diamond inside so this, uh, this free spectrohedron defined by the matrices. And uh, the matrices being compatible quantum effects is equivalent to the full level inclusion. And you have these, uh, the equality also of these, uh, these sets which define robustness of these, uh, these types of inclusion. And finally, let me, let me end with another, uh, another 
problem, another, another, another equivalence of the same of the same type. I'm not stating the theorem, just giving you the keywords. So if you look at the matrix cube, remember that here we had the matrix diamond in relation to compatibility. Well, the matrix cube corresponds, is kind of the dual of the matrix diamond, and this inclusion of matrix cubes or whatever is equivalent to kind of a dual problem to compatibility, which is uh, quantum steering. So steering inequality violations can be, there is a, you know, can be formulated equivalently in terms of matrix cube inclusion. So this, this equivalence also holds in this, uh, in this regime. And with this, I would like to stop. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you very much, Ion. Uh, are there questions? Oh, sorry. Are there questions? I, I would have a question once you finished on site ones. Um, David. Oh, please, please go ahead, Milanjana. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ion, for this very interesting talk. And uh, you've talked about the connection between compatibility of quantum measurements and free spectrohedra. Mm -hmm. Uh, so my question is, do you expect such a connection also to exist for compatibility of quantum channels, which is also a well-defined concept? Yes, Hanin and Jana, thanks, thanks for the question. Yes, we have, we have thought about it. Uh, we have some ideas, so uh, it, it turns out that it does. There, there, there are some problems. So the first, the first thing is that you need to replace this, this object here, this discrete object, this matrix diamond, by something which is a, a much more complicated spectrohedron. And that at level one, you will not have uh, you know, you know, you don't have, you know, a bunch of quantum, ch are, are these objects quantum channels and, you know, full level, are these objects compatible quantum channels? At level one, you will have, are these objects uh, 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 compatible quantum channels where the joint thing doesn't need to be completely positive, but just positive. So it's not so nice. Uh, if, you, if you just copy, if you just copy paste the proofs and you, you don't, you know, you, know we, you don't think too much, which is what we did for now, uh, you don't get this, this very nice, this, this nice equivalence. And this is coming from the fact that you need to replace this matrix diamond by a more complicated object, which makes things uh, not so nice. Okay. But thanks for the questions. Yes. Thank you. Any other question here or? Oh, there's another one there. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a nice talk. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, does your equivalent characterization of compatibility translate into simpler forms when you consider like qubits or qtrait an arbitrary number of measurements? Like um, uh, maybe you have uh, some um, set of inequalities which you can produce out of your characterization. Yes, so thanks for the question. It turns out that um, you know, if you want if you want to have uh, measurements with more outcomes, which I think is, is is the question, yes, then you have you have to replace this matrix diamond by something that we call a matrix jewel, which is kind of a, a combinatorial uh, like a you know uh, like a con combinatorial construction of a, of a convex uh, a body, and it's it's very it's it's not so nice. So the uh, the case in which these techniques work best and give you the most results are really uh, many uh, many measurements with two outcomes. Uh, if you have, you know, a large number of outcomes, I mean, more, more, more than two outcomes, then, uh, you know, we, we can state this equivalence. We can, uh, you know, we, can, we, have, we have basically the same theorem. But the problem is that the, on, the, on the spectrohedron side, these objects have not been studied. They are much less symmetric. And all the techniques that we use to get these, counts, these, these bounds and these things, uh, they break down because of lack of symmetry. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't work so well on that side. Actually, on that side, what we could do is we could use, we could do it the, the other way around. We could use techniques from quantum information to prove things about these, uh, these objects, these free spectrohedra, which were not known. But, uh, yeah. Uh. Any other question? I have a small one. I mean, is there any connection? Or how, can you use these techniques for non-locality instead of for just the steering and these things? So, I mean, like, Bell inequalities, etc. cetera? Yeah, uh, we, we have thought about it. We didn't succeed, but it's on the to-do list. If, uh, if you have any ideas, we'd be happy to. Sure, sure. I mean, this looks like the type of problem with, where this would work, right? Because you have classical and quantum things. So, yeah, classical should be level one, quantum full level, but we don't know how, uh, how to put this into this framework. But, uh, yeah, any, any suggestions are, are welcome. Okay, thank you very much. So let's thank you again. Okay, so uh, maybe Nilanjana, I mean, I 
invite you to close the session because unfortunately, I mean, Nilanjana is the, the other organizer and unfortunately she, she cannot be with us, but I think, I mean, maybe it's a good idea if you just, I mean, say yes, a couple of words to close the session. If you are still there. Okay, ah, okay thank uh, you. Yes, I definitely am still here. Uh, first of all, uh, a huge thank you to all the speakers, uh, both on-site and online ones. This hybrid system is not the best, I must say, because uh, it's best to be in the same place, but under the current conditions, uh, it's the best we can do. And uh, so thank you very much for uh, to all the speakers for making the effort to give a talk um, either online or on-site. And, um, and a huge thank you to David, because I had to cancel my trip in the last moment due to some family reasons. And it was wonderful how David agreed and so willingly uh, chaired every single session. Thanks very much. And um, thank you to all of you for attending the talks and for the questions. And I hope for those who are there on site, uh, you all had some good discussions. And um, I, I haven't um, followed all the questions online, but hopefully um, the interested um, participants will contact the speakers um, for follow-up questions and discussions. Thank you, everybody, and have a good summer. <laughs>